Hello everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Bilal Mark McDowell Bomani, a uh, senior research scientist at NASA's Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. I happen to be the person uh, responsible for the Green Lab Research Facility. The Green Lab is dedicated to two significant uh, things. Number one, we're dedicated to developing the next generation of aviation biomass or optimizing biomass by not using fresh water, not competing with food crops, and not using arable land. What we're trying to do is to be extreme green. And so that's a concept that we came up with uh, because as green can be alternative or sustainable or renewable, we have to be all three, extreme green. The second component of the Green Lab is self-sustainability. So one thing that we're doing is we're combining wind, solar, and hydro energy to power the Green Lab for up to five hours a day. So our, our biggest push now is self-sustainable renewable energy ecosystems, and these ecosystems can be used around the world. We actually have a lab dedicated to what we call a climatic adaptation of algae and halophytes. Uh, a lot of people don't know what halophytes are, but a halophyte is a salt-tolerating plant. Mm -hmm. No plant likes salt, but halophytes tolerate salt. And the good thing about them is they meet the specs that we need for jet fuel, what we call biojet. Uh, and the greatest thing about them is they can grow in any type of environment, fresh water to salt water. So our lab, the Green Lab Research Facility, is dedicated to the optimization of what we call aviation biomass species. Now the difficulty with that is we have a solution for water, we got a solution for fuel, and believe it or not, those plants are edible. So in theory, we can have a solution for food in third world countries next to the coastline. So Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, if you're next to the coastline, we use sand as our substrate, you can grow food and have that food used in a different area for fuel. So you can create an industry, if you will. The thing that we missed is energy. And that's what we've been concentrating on the last two years. Self-sustainable renewable energy ecosystems. We know our ecosystem is stable, it works. However, if you are somewhere in a remote area that has high wind or all around the world, boom, we have a solution. We use wind energy. That's good, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, if you're somewhere else and you have a lot of sun, uh, then you use solar energy. That's now, great. we live in Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> well, I live in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, the lab is in Cleveland, Ohio. We have to take advantage of both. Mm -hmm. And so what we have attached to the Green Lab are two uh, wind turbines. They're actually spinning now. We have a solar array field where our goal is to have five hours of no direct electricity per day. We're using that as a microgrid concept that we're using for other ecosystems around the world. What we really would like to do is replicate our lab anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we're taking our algae experiments that you see in the lab. We have two algae tanks that are uh, going at it now, I guess, optimizing experiments. And we're going to take that technology to transfer that to business and industry. Let's talk about the uh, tanks we saw in the lab. There are two of them. One was a dark green and one was a much lighter green. But why, why the difference in color and what's the significance there? Okay. Now, the one that was lighter green is what we call version 1 algae mm -hmm. uh, 1.0. And what that is, we're using a different mixing technique. and It, it grows very, very well until we noticed that there was a deficiency in mixing. The second thing that you see is a revolutionary idea. It's using high-powered uh, wave generators, mm -hmm. and it gives a tidal wave mix. And so what you actually saw, they, th both of those tanks started at the same time mm -hmm. on Tuesday. It is now mm -hmm. Friday. Mm -hmm. You see different levels of growth I from see. the same species, mm -hmm. which is Cenodesmus dimorphus. The significance of what you saw today, and I, as I mentioned, it is revolutionary mm -hmm. in that we have never got this much growth ever. So the old way is still better than what was being used. Our new way is, as you saw, three times better, three times better. From, the, from the book, Real-Time NASA Data Analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so from Tuesday to Friday, L1 grew 12 times. My goodness, yes. And L2 grew 46 times, okay. the original. All right. And so we're on to something there. Excellent. So the question is, how is algae used for fuel? Well, uh, we go back to something called Hubert's Peak. And Huber's peak is a metric that we're going to have peak oil. Three years ago, it was 2025. We're going to, run, we're going to reach our peak oil. 
Last year was 2015. Now it's 2013, which means we're going to be at an optimal oil consumption, which means our supply and demand is going to reverse. So we have to come up with alternative solutions. Algae is a viable option. However, at the present time, it's prohibitively expensive. So we're doing research in algae that may not come to what we call your commercial uh, use for about another 10 years. But we have to be in it because that is a viable technology. What is viable now is halophytes. Using halophytes all over the world. What a lot of people don't know is 47% of the world's land is non-arid, which means nothing is growing on there. And so if you're next to a coastline with nothing there, grow halophytes. Give you another metric. If we had enough land mass, or the land mass of the state of Maryland, with our algae and halophytes, we'll have enough energy or fuel to power the entire United States needs. If we use that same technique in the Sahara Desert in Africa, we'll have enough fuel for the entire world. Then you may ask, well, why isn't everyone using it? Uh, because you can still go to the gas pump and get reasonable price gas. But if gas was $20 a gallon, you'll be knocking at our, our, our door. And so we're actually working on what we call the next generation of, uh, of fuels. Uh, and uh, this microgrid concept with the self-sustainable renewable energy ecosystem. And you mentioned an interesting experiment too, or, or something going to augment with the lab um, using, because uh, the sunlight only lasts till sundown, mm -hmm. and then you're going to use, uh, you're going to pump water into a, into a water tower? How, how will that work? Yes, yes, yes. function of that? Now first let me tell you for the viewers, yes I know this is a hundred year old technology, yeah, okay, sure. but we're actually applying it to a microgrid concept, mm -hmm. and that is all of these water towers around the country are, most of them don't have anything, you, they're not being used. Mm -hmm. So our idea is any excess wind or solar energy pumps the water up to this uh, uh, tower and it's stored until you need it. It's like a demand. Mm -hmm. And so once the uh, wind and solar die down, mm -hmm. you would turn on this water tower. It would create what we call, by gravity, it would create a PSI pressure and it would run a turbine. I see. And that mm -hmm. turbine is connected to a generator, generator. Mm -hmm. and that's how we'll get uh, okay. uh, energy from there. All right, very good. Okay. And so we're, we're, we're doing a prototype experiment for the Green Lab. It's only going to be about 15 feet tall. Mm -hmm. However, I just got clearance today. We're going to actually implement on a real water tower. And it's for, uh, I think it's 200,000 gallons mm -hmm. on the other side of NASA that hasn't been used for a while. Okay, very good. Very good. And you said that it would produce about uh, 40 watts for some... Uh, our, our small unit will be about 40 watts mm -hmm. continuous. Mm -hmm. And no. the southern one is about 250 watt continuous. I want to explain to you why it's continuous. Uh, once we pump the water up mm -hmm. and it comes back down, some of that energy is going to be used to pump it back pump again. It back so again. it's going to be like a recirculating. All right. All right. So you can capture some of that. And lastly, our push is a step. We believe that uh, the future of our students uh, or is going to involve STEM or what we call highly paid jobs. And uh, our lab housed over 40 interns over the last three years three university professors, countless universities, uh, countless businesses. And what we are providing for the local community is a place where you can not only hear about science, uh, not only see science, you can get your hands on. So we have a hands-on lab, so much so, we've had over 4,000 students visit the Green Lab Research Facility in the last three years. And I'm very proud of that fact. So not only is NASA creating jobs for the future in all different majors, you are also stopping the subsidized monies that's coming from the government to sustain programs like this because they'll be self-sufficient and be able to run on its own through the different majors that can benefit. Well, the good thing about the Green Lab is there are companies paying NASA for their expertise. Exactly. The technical expertise. Right. So uh, the, the system that we're now hopefully uh, implementing in this, for the city of Akron, they're paying NASA for that. Right. And so we are making what we call a value-added product to the nation from NASA technology versus NASA looking for what we, is, is what we some may call a corporate handout. Right. So yeah, we're actually creating, uh, 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 let's say, a baseline job network for the future. Yeah, so Thank th you. Th that's good. Thank you.